Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long interview program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, Rashmahan Gandhi, research professor at the University of Illinois and former member of the Indian Parliament, talks about his book, Gandhi, The Man, His People, and the Empire. The book is a biography of Professor Gandhi's grandfather, Indian independence leader and practitioner of nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi. Professor Gandhi discusses his book with Amitabh Paul, managing editor at the Progressive Magazine. This interview was recorded on the C-SPAN bus in Chicago during the Chicago Tribune Printer's Row Book Fair. Professor Gandhi, unlike all us admirers of Gandhi and uh, people who write about him, of whom they are legions, you have a really unique vantage point since you're his grandson, the child of his youngest son, Devdas Gandhi. And uh, this has given you a really unique perspective. Could we start off with some memories you have of your grandfather since you were 12 and a half when he was assassinated in uh, January 1948? Well, he had four sons. And as you said, my father, Devdas, was the youngest of the four. Um, I was born in 35. Uh, Gandhi was assassinated uh, when I was 12 and a half. Uh, he did spend uh, a good portion of the last two years of his life in New Delhi, which is where I was going to school, where my father was a newspaper man. And so in that, during that period, I saw a good deal of him. Before that, he was for a long time in prison. I did visit him as a boy of seven or eight in, in prison, when he was in prison. That's when my grandmother uh, died uh, in Pune. Uh, but in that final phase of his life, when he was uh, uh, trying to cope with the violence that accompanied independence, uh, he did live on six months or so after India became independent, but he saw uh, that there had been not only partition, but also great violence involving Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, there were many chances to see him during that, that period. Of course, uh, I didn't have enormously long periods with him. Family first was not his motto. Uh, he had to deal with uh, uh, the Hindus and Sikhs who had come away as refugees from Pakistan. He had to deal with the Muslims of Delhi who were being pushed out of Delhi. So both groups were uh, trying to meet him. So, but uh, my siblings and I and my parents and I, we did have some wonderful uh, moments with him. He was very affectionate during the relatively uh, brief encounters we had. He used to greet uh, grandchildren, somebody like me, with a great thump on the back. Uh, he was always bantering and teasing. My young brother was two and a half and he, uh, or so towards the end of his life. So he and grandfather would make faces at each other. Uh, but the most uh, powerful memory is of uh, how he coped with um, unhappiness, resentment, even sometimes hostility from some people who were unhappy uh, about his position. In particular, at his multi-faith prayer meetings, when there was a recitation from the Quran, some unhappy uh, uh, young uh, Hindus and Sikhs who had come away from Pakistan would object to the recitation of the Quran. I would be seated uh, fairly close to him, and together we would see this uh, very large and friendly audience, but some in that audience were angry with him. So the way he uh, dealt with uh, these protests and, the, uh, and these angry uh, objectors to the recitation from the Quran. He, he dealt with them in a friendly way, uh, but he didn't uh, yield his position. Uh, and I was sometimes afraid that, that these people would come and maybe try and knock him down. And I would ask myself, what would be my responsibility if this happened? Um, when actually he was killed that day, I was not uh, at this prayer mm. meeting. He was killed on his way to this prayer meeting. Sure, uh, I was in school. There was some sporting event that prevented me from being there. Otherwise, I would have been. Uh, so it was uh, not just his uh, very uh, affectionate and very warm and teasing relationship to somebody like me that I recall, but also his. Uh, I was surprised that he could be so civil with these people who were so angry at him. You come from such an illustrious family, uh, your paternal grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi, one of the most famous people in the world, your maternal grandfather, C. Rajgopal Chari, another really famous Indian freedom fighter. Your father was the editor of one of India's leading newspapers, the Hindustan Times. For your oldest uncle, being Gandhi's son, 
was a real burden and uh, he became a wreck, died soon after Gandhi, just a few months after Gandhi. For you, uh, being Gandhi's grandson, has it been a boon or a burden? On balance, a boon. Uh, because people are very nice to me, they're friendly to me, respectful uh, to me, whether in India or outside India. Uh, of course, it also means that people want uh, me to uh, always speak about him or, or uh, I have to be, you might say, on duty much of the time. Uh, and so, uh, for somebody like me who likes to be uh, by himself, to read, to write, to research, uh, it's not always uh, pleasant. Uh, the, uh, the realization that people expect something from you but uh, oh it's nothing compared with the wonderful opportunities I have because I think it's much tougher for the eldest son it was very very tough even for the other sons it was tough but for grandchildren a uh, good deal less difficult and it seems to me that Gandhi mellowed as time went on yes. and he was actually uh, much gentler with your father, say, than with uh, his oldest two sons, who he was much, much more strict with. I think that is, uh, that is certainly what the older sons felt, and I think there is truth in that. Uh, but I would say it's not so much that he was uh, not mellow or rough with his uh, older boys. It's just that at that stage, um, uh, the clash between Gandhi's feeling that he uh, had to look after first the Indian community in South Africa and then afterwards the Indian people as a whole, uh, that clashed with his, uh, with what the sons expected. They wanted him to look after the sons above all. So that, that tension was a very uh, strong uh, reality in, in the family's life. In fact, there's been a recent uh, good Indian movie called Gandhi, My Father, yes. which has dealt on the, uh, yeah. with the relationship between Gandhi and his older yes. son, which yeah. I just saw yes. just a couple of weeks ago. Yes, yes. How did Gandhi's interest in non-violence start? Uh, to me, it's kind of confusing because Gandhi himself varied on his answer when asked that question. Was it that moment in South Africa when he was thrown off a train or was it something larger than that? I think it's a series of events that take place. Uh, to some extent, uh, the family background, also the, the Jain uh, scholars who are, uh, uh, who are close to the family, of course, uh, non-violence is a very strong element of Hinduism also, but it's an even stronger element of Jainism and of Buddhism. So that was there in, in his childhood. Uh, he, he received those impulses, but he is also on record as saying that he wanted to drive out the British and he wanted the young boys to be strong and that's how he started eating meat because he thought that by eating meat the Indians would be tough and they'd be able to drive the British out. And indeed, as a youngster, uh, as a boy and then as a young man in, in London and then maybe in his early months in South Africa, he probably had some very strong violent feelings about uh, oppression from the, the white race or the, col uh, the colonizers imperialists. Um, Tolstoy has a very large role in, in his uh, finding uh, non-violence as, as, as an answer. Uh, I would say his uh, readings of the religious scriptures also play a part. He, uh, the Sermon on the Mount and Tolstoy's reading of it, interpretation of it, and Gandhi's own reaction to the Sermon on the Mount was a very powerful element in his understanding uh, and feeling that non-violence is, is the way. Um, so, uh, of course, he, uh, what exactly he drew from Thoreau uh, is not utterly clear, or when he drew it. it the, uh, the, the impression I get from researching and studying it is that he was familiar with Thoreau's ideas, but it was the reality of the situation in South Africa that he had to deal with that led him to the first non-violent uh, movement in South Africa, which, as you know, uh, was declared on September 11, 1906. Isn't that ironic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and talking of September 11th, um, Samuel Huntington in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, published a book called uh, Clash of Civilizations. Post September 11th, a lot of Americans have bought into that thesis that perhaps there is an inevitable clash of civilizations between the West and Islam. Gandhi spent pretty much his whole life, his whole adult life, trying to uh, act as a bridge between Hinduism and Islam and the West in his own way. How do you think Gandhi's life sort of uh, juxtaposes or sort of contrasts the whole clash of civilization thesis? Yes, I think Gandhi is a great reminder to us that the clash of civilization thesis need not be accepted without scrutiny and examination and challenge. Uh, Nobody can say that Gandhi's life has solved the Hindu-Muslim question on the subcontinent. It has not. 
but has it uh, reduced the tensions? Has it made millions of people aware of the possibility of coexistence, of friendship, of partnership? I would say the answer to that is absolutely yes. And so, um, as far as the subcontinent is concerned, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India has 13% Muslims, Bangladesh is about 15% Hindus, Pakistan has about 2.5% or so uh, Hindus. So uh, we have no choice. The Hindus and Muslims of the subcontinent have to live together. Uh, we can't say that because there is this theory that we can't live, therefore we'll have to have a fight. Uh, and Gandhi was also aware of that, quite apart from his very deep feeling, his philosophical view that uh, there was nothing in Hinduism or in Islam that prevented his Hindus and Muslims from working together, living together as, as friends, as good neighbors. Apart from that, the sheer practical necessity of living together, because uh, you can't change geography. And so uh, Gandhi, uh, because of his, uh, his life and what he has left for us, tells us that uh, yes, he, often uh, things are very tough, they look almost very difficult. Many Muslims may feel that the West is bent on oppressing us or, or insulting Islam, insulting the Prophet. And many in the West uh, uh, would say, well, look at so many of these terrorist acts in so many of these cases, the perpetrators seem to be Muslim. Sometimes they commit these acts in the name of Islam. So should, maybe there is something. But I think uh, these um, feelings, whether on the Western side or on the Islamic side, uh, uh, should should be uh, kind of reflected upon and and I think Gandhi's life is a wonderful counter to those feelings. And what is also not well known in the United States is that a number of uh, Muslim figures actually joined Gandhi. Uh, one of the most remarkable, you've written a biography of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who was in uh, the northwest region of Pakistan bordering Afghanistan, there are a number of others too. Could you please talk briefly about that? Yes, I'm very glad you've mentioned uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who was born in 1890. He was um, uh, 21 years uh, younger than Gandhi and he lived till 1988. Uh, he died at the age of 98. He spent 27 years in prison, 12 years under the British and 15 years under the Pakistani rulers. He was an absolutely committed fighter for nonviolence. He wanted the independence of the subcontinent. Uh, he was aware of the history of the West's uh, rule over uh, the non-West, you might say. Uh, but he was utterly convinced that nonviolence was the only sound way. He was also convinced that nonviolence uh, and Islam were totally compatible. And he also uh, felt that uh, not only can Muslims and Hindus live together, but Muslims and Christians and Muslims and Jews can live together. So his life is, is, a, is a wonderful accompaniment to the life of Gandhi. So, uh, so they are brothers in spirit and, and it is uh, uh, desirable that more people in the West come to know and more people in the Islamic world come to know of this remarkable life of this man who was the Pashtun uh, and who till his last breath uh, believed in non-violence and in the compatibility of Muslims and non-Muslims. So a number of others too like Maulana Abul Kalam Azad yes. and uh, other people in the Congress party yes. who joined Gandhi. And Maulana Azad who was the president of the Indian National Congress for several years uh, during the Second World War uh, and his statement in 1948 Ramgarh uh, at the Congress session uh, where he gives his passionate conviction about uh, uh, how Hindus and Muslims can have no life except a life together is, is, is a classic statement and it is still is relevant for our times. And a Muslim theologian, no less. Yes, he was and with his commentary on the Quran too. Yeah. To place Gandhi in the present day context, how would Gandhi have dealt with say the attacks of September 11th? What would his response have been? And I know I'm asking you to project. Of course, this is, it's not possible really to speculate. Uh, after all, Gandhi did die in '48, um, um, and I, I think uh, if we study Gandhi's life, uh, what we uh, I think gather from it is that he takes uh, attacks, hostility, oppression very seriously. So he's not for condoning horrible, horrible attacks. Uh, he's also for resisting them. Um, and we also know that although nonviolence was a great principle in his life, we do know that there were times when he 
associated himself with a violent response. In World War I, he tried to recruit soldiers. Uh, some of his colleagues were quite astonished by it, but he had his own reasons. Um, during World War II, when uh, the Quit India movement was launched in India, uh, Gandhi uh, was totally in favor of uh, a statement that if India was granted freedom, then Allied troops, American troops, British troops, could be on Indian soil uh, to fight uh, Germany and fight Japan. Um, so we can't say that Gandhi would have said there should be no response or, or if there had to be a violent response to a terrorist attack. I myself feel that I can see Gandhi somehow living with it. Again, I'm saying this is speculation. Uh, sure. At the same time, I think what Gandhi would have really tried to ask uh, the Western world, something like this. Um, there is this reality. People are very angry. Why are they angry? We should find out. Is it entirely their fault? Is there something wrong in Islam that makes them do it? Gandhi would say, no. I know so many Muslims. There is Ghaffar Khan, there is Abul Kalam Azad, uh, there are so many, uh, there is Ansari, there is Hakim Ajmal Khan uh, that I know, and they were the Muslims who were close colleagues of his in South Africa. So he had a lifetime of experience of very close cooperation, partnership with wonderful Muslims who shared his core beliefs. So Gandhi would say that uh, the Western world needs also to do a lot of reflection to see. So I think his challenge would have been also for, for more dialogue. Not only dialogue between Christians and Jews and Muslims in America, but a dialogue between Americans and the Muslim world, Americans and the Middle Eastern world, Americans in the Arab world, Americans in the Iranian world, the Turkish world. What about the other uh, current event that has preoccupied the United States for the past half a decade or so now? That's the Iraq war. And here I'm not asking you to speculate as much as to place the Iraq war in the framework of Gandhian nonviolence and sort of, you know, how sort of that contrasts. Yes, I think it's a. Uh, as I don't know whether uh, you, you noticed in the book or not, but he, uh, when uh, Iraq was being created after the First World War, um, uh, Gandhi made a reference to the oil of Mosul uh, as a factor in, in the uh, British or Western planning for, for that area. He was very aware that uh, it wasn't a great love of democracy that had brought the European powers to the Middle East, but it was uh, oil and uh, factors like that. So I think Gandhi would uh, want everybody to be very clear on what the real issues are. Uh, he would have been a great foe of tyranny, Saddam Hussein's tyranny or any other kind of tyranny, because as we all know, Gandhi was not only a fighter for India's independence, he was a great fighter for democracy at every level, and certainly at the national level. Uh, so. Um, but he would not have uh, readily accepted the idea that it's because democracy is necessary in the Middle East and therefore this great armed intervention is called for. Uh, so I think he would have, uh, he would have challenged America to, uh, to really understand the world, understand itself and understand that the, the, the route to real prestige in the world is, is not this kind of military intervention. Professor Gandhi, you've written a remarkable book on your grandfather, uh, especially the last couple of years, the description of Gandhi from 1946 onward in that is so moving. I mean, him trying to act as a bridge between uh, the Hindus and the Muslims, trying to quell communal riots uh, on his own is just absolutely remarkable, the description of him uh, in the last two years of his life. Um, with nonviolence, and here's a question that all us admirers of nonviolence have to face, and Gandhi had to face in his lifetime too, and you've written about it in the book, and that's uh, perhaps uh, the most evil phenomenon that uh, the world has known at least in the past century, Nazism and Adolf Hitler. And uh, Gandhi's response to Hitler, as you point out in your book, uh, even a lot of uh, his colleagues uh, and his close ones were kind of discomforted, uh, and perhaps he himself didn't know exactly how to deal with it um, and uh, could you sort of uh, expand on what his response was and how we try to deal with it? Sure. 
uh, when 38 happened, Munich happened, Gandhi issued a very strong statement. He was quite furious at what uh, Britain and France had done as far as Czechoslovakia was concerned. And he said something like this, this is not his exact words, but that uh, it seems as if only a war can uh, deal with this ma man like Hitler. And then when the war actually took place in 39, um, uh, Gandhi again made a very strong statement, ag again recalling that maybe only force can deal with Hitler. So he had a, a I don't say that he fully understood Hitler in all his evil. He was far away in India, but he had a sense. He had his uh, many Jewish friends from his South African days who also kept him informed. Um, but in Gandhi's case, as was also true of, mo of most Indians, uh, they could not divorce the Hitler phenomenon, the Nazi phenomenon, from India's need for independence. India was eager to join the fight against Hitler uh, as long as some indication was given that India too would be independent. But if Britain and Britain's allies were indifferent to India's future, indifferent about India's freedom, then India would not say that merely because Hitler exists and this horrible man exists, therefore India should suspend all its independence activity. Uh, now, Gandhi stood passionately for nonviolence for India's independence movement, and there were many critics of Gandhi's uh, strategy who proposed a violent alternative. And for very profound reasons, both practical and philosophical, Gandhi felt that this was very, uh, a very a wrong course for India to take. He felt that if violence was justified in India's freedom movement, then the strong, the well-positioned, the dominating groups in India, who were also armed people, people with arms, they would then dominate over the weak, the vulnerable majority of India. Gandhi was absolutely convinced that if violence was accepted in India, it would mean the domination of the weak by the strong. So he had to defend non-violence. So when his critics said to him, uh, can nonviolence work against Hitler? He could, could not say, no, it cannot work against Hitler. He had to say that nonviolence would work against anybody. And that is when he made these statements that the, the Jews, Jews yes. in, in Germany, uh, that if they, that he always said they should resist Hitler, yes. but they should resist him nonviolently. Oh. He also said if resistance invited a massacre, maybe that massacre might be used uh, also to arouse uh, humanity's conscience. Uh, it sounded, uh, uh, you know, quite harsh uh, uh, and, uh, to many people. But we should understand the context in which he said this. We should understand that he said this in order to defend what he felt was the universal applicability of nonviolence. But we should also understand that Gandhi, the professor of nonviolence, was different from the practitioner of nonviolence. So if he had been a Jew in Germany in the 30s, what would he have done? Would he have found some nonviolent method of fighting Hitler? Maybe. If not, would he have joined in even a violent fight against Hitler? I would say maybe. Yes, I was uh, fortunate enough to interview Jean Sharp, who's a, uh, an advocate of nonviolent resistance. And he says that actually Gandhi was much more pragmatic in his use of nonviolence than people make him out to be. Oh, he this is evident in, in every, every one of his uh, satyagrahas or nonviolent actions in South Africa and in India, in a whole series of them. His, his pragmatism is there, is a strong feature of his life. Another leading figure uh, in the World War II era, Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. who didn't look upon Gandhi too kindly. And in fact, in a couple of instances, actually uh, wished death upon him. Uh, can you, can you sort of uh, just talk a bit about the relationship between Churchill and Gandhi? There's been actually a new book out, yes, which I, I haven't had a chance to read. Nor have I yet managed to read it, but uh, as you have found, uh, Churchill-Gandhi relationship is an is a important strand of, of my, uh, my book. The, um, um, Churchill uh, also had a South African connection. He went to cover the uh, Boer War, as it was called, the war between the British and the Afrikaners, the Dutch, at the end of the 1890s. Um, Gandhi was in, in South Africa and there is uh, some evidence to suggest that Churchill was familiar with Gandhi's struggle in South Africa um, uh, the time when Gandhi was almost lynched and uh, by some very angry whites uh, again at the uh, in 1897 I think this was and um, 
The only time that Gandhi and Churchill met was in 1906 when Churchill was in the Liberal Party. He was the Under Secretary for Colonies. Gandhi was visiting England from South Africa on behalf of the Indians of South Africa and they had a fairly cordial meeting. This was the first time they met. And then when Gandhi returned to India and took up the cause of India's independence, that made Churchill quite unhappy and Churchill was really strongly opposed to that. And so um, and that uh, affected the future relationship. And then Gandhi's Great Salt March of 1930, which was a tremendous success, and the fact that thereafter the Viceroy then invited Gandhi for talks, and then Churchill uh, issued this famous alarm that this half-naked man is being allowed to climb the steps of the Viceregal Palace uh, to meet, to parley on equal terms with the representative of, of the King Emperor. Churchill was very unhappy with that, very angry with that. Uh, thereafter, Gandhi went to England for negotiations with the British. He tried to meet Churchill, but Churchill uh, was unwilling to meet him. Uh, so they did not meet at that time. Uh, much later, when India became independent, and this was after Churchill lost the elections in the UK, the Labour Party came to power after the war, and India got its independence, so Churchill was uh, unhappy with that. He kind of opposed it also. Uh, and then an exchange took place, uh, they didn't meet, but an exchange took place over the killings that had occurred in India. And Churchill then made, in September of 47, made this very strong statement about the butcheries taking place, uh, predictable, expected, now that the British have left. Uh, he even said that there will now be a vast abridgment of the population of, of India. And Gandhi's response to that statement, I think, is a very remarkable response. First of all, he translates Churchill's statement word for word before the Indian people at this prayer meeting of his, where he gives his speech, which is then uh, published in all the newspapers, it's also relayed on the radio. So he tells the Indian people, this is what Churchill is saying. And all of you, you have not listened to me, you have fought each other, you have given him the chance to make this kind of statement. But then he also takes Churchill to task. And he says, uh, yes, a few hundred thousand people have indeed taken to this path of barbarism. But that doesn't mean that all the millions of India have taken to it. And why are you referring to it with such relish and such exaggeration? So Gandhi, I would say, tackles Churchill non-violently but very effectively. Is it safe to say that India probably wouldn't have gotten independence in 1947 if Churchill had won re-election? Yes, I think it would have been delayed, but by this time the British people also uh, were more aware of what was happening, what the world was feeling. Soldiers had gone all over the world and seen what the world was, how the world was thinking. Yes, if Churchill had been uh, re-elected in 45, uh, India's independence would have been considerably delayed. Thank you, Professor Gandhi. Uh, it has been a pleasure talking with you and we'll be taking a short break now. Afterwards, and several other C-SPAN programs are available for download as podcasts. Visit booktv.org. More with Rajmahan Gandhi and Amitabh Paul. This summer, Book TV is asking, what are you reading? Senator Mitch McConnell, what are you reading this summer? Well, this summer I'm reading uh, a book about uh, Winston Churchill's uh, rise to power called Troublesome Young Men. It's about the young members of the Conservative Party in uh, Britain in the late 1930s that were disgusted by the appeasement of the Neville uh, Chamberlain uh, administration toward the Germans and the Nazis. And so they wanted to change and they orchestrated the election of Winston Churchill, which widely was believed uh, to have elevated the most important leader of World War II. Right before that, I read uh, David Halberstam's last book, The Coldest Winter. Uh, it was about the Korean War. And before that, I read The Great Upheaval by Jay Winnick about the decade from the 1790s to uh, 1800. And what was going on, not only in the United States, but the French Revolution and in Russia as well. It sort of tied all of the world events during that incredible decade of the 1790s uh, together all at one time. How do you choose which books to read? I'm mostly interested in American history. Um, after I finish uh, Troubles from Young Men, I'm going to move on to a, a biography of uh, James K. Polk, 
who was uh, a one-term president who did remarkable things, including uh, bringing in uh, Texas and much of the uh, southwestern part of the United States into the United States. Do you have a favorite book? Well, what? Do you have a favorite book? Oh, goodness. It'd be hard to pick one, but I guess if I had to pick one in the last couple of years, I would say Team of Rivals. Uh, Doris Kearns good, Goodwin's book about Lincoln and the uh, people who competed for him, with him, for the Republican nomination, who he later put in his cabinet. Senator Mitch McConnell on Book TV. To see more summer reading lists and other program information, visit our website at booktv.org. Afterwards, with Rajmohan Gandhi and Amitabh Paul continues. We've talked about Adolf Hitler. In general, Professor Gandhi, uh, do you feel there are limits to the efficacy and use of nonviolence? Certainly, certainly. I would readily concede that uh, there are occasions when uh, nonviolence might not work. Uh, that is, I'm now giving my view. I think sure. Gandhi might disagree with that. Although in practice, he also at times um, associated himself with some actions of the use of force. Gandhi's economic critique and view uh, was quite unique. Uh, he was critical of capitalism in many aspects, but so of state-centered socialism. Uh, and many people in the West and the United States, most people do not know what his economic worldview was about. Could you please elaborate a bit on that? Um, he was a very practical human being <clears throat> and he was aware that the state made a very poor businessman and he certainly was of the view that uh, if the state tried to run business trade manufacturers uh, it was and since people didn't have an incentive uh, a government servant in charge of uh, business doesn't have the incentive that a business owner has so Gandhi was practical enough to understand that that would not work. Uh, but he was also uh, very uh, sharply aware, especially in India, but the world as a whole, of the enormous gulf between the, the very few rich and the very many very poor. Uh, and so he felt that something had to be done. So he was willing, uh, now in the Indian context, when there was a very strong socialist wing in the Indian National Congress, when they proposed certain measures, uh, for state intervention, uh, Gandhi was uh, willing to, to go along with, with some of those. Uh, but he was aware of the great limitations, the great hazards of state intervention in the economy. Um, in the world as a whole also, uh, Gandhi's assessment was that uh, powerful nations are not always actuated by very noble motives. Uh, so he was aware of the tendency of powerful nations to dominate over, to take away the resources of, of poor nations. So he was aware of the need for uh, poorer nations, especially those at the time that were directly ruled by European powers, Western powers. That they had to be an independent struggle which also had to have an economic component. He, of course, uh, ideally he favored a very decentralized, cooperative type of uh, economic structure. Yes. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes, this was an uh, essential uh, uh, point that uh, Gandhi tried to convey to, uh, especially to the Indian people, uh, that um, uh, something done from Delhi for all the villages. He was always uh, conscious of uh, the reality in 700,000 different villages of India. Uh, and he was keen for each village to develop its uh, ruling structure, its, as well as its economic structure. Ideally, he would have liked each village also to be self-sufficient, if possible, to grow its food, grow its cloth, um, have enough feed for its cattle, to have uh, a self-sufficient kind of, uh, of, of idea. And if, if a particular area couldn't do it, it should have a relationship with its immediate neighbor, not with a very far neighbor. 
This was very broadly his, his view. Uh, he was not doctrinaire about this, although sometimes if his statements are read, you may get that impression that he had this very strong approach, that he was anti-industry, uh, and people do contrast his vision with Nehru's vision, that Nehru wanted an industrialized India, whereas Gandhi wanted to take India back to some ancient time. I think that is a, a kind of exaggerated notion. There is some truth. Uh, there was a great difference between the two, and Gandhi emphasized the individual, Gandhi emphasized the village, Gandhi emphasized the decentralized unit, uh, whereas Nehru was apt to, uh, to emphasize a centralized approach. Um, so both for uh, democratic reasons and for practical reasons, Gandhi was for empowering the individual rather than empowering the state. This is very important. Gandhi was not against using the state for some necessary purposes, but he was very um, mistrustful of a powerful state and he his his strongest passion was for empowering the weakest individual and in this he partly drew upon the vision of Tolstoy didn't he yes he did he did uh, Tolstoy's uh, vision uh, uh, was a very powerful influence not only for non-violence but for his understanding of, uh, of of the limitations and the risks of a powerful state yes you talk about Gandhi's critique of industrialization. One of his most famous works, Hind Swaraj, is about that. In fact, in the United States and maybe in the West in general, as you said, the caricature is of him as somebody who was against modernization, against industrialization. In fact, New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof went even further than that. In a book some years ago, he blamed Gandhi for the starving children in India, saying that because of his critique of capitalism, uh, and industrialization that India has remained poor. How would you respond to that? Well, I think um, that is, of course, uh, that kind of state uh, comment w would be a superficial comment. Um, uh, Gandhi's uh, passion was the, the poor Indian, and although he embraced simplicity uh, and he voiced serious concern about uh, reckless industrialization, he wanted uh, simplicity as a value for himself in order to equip himself to fight harder to reduce the poverty of the children of India. And this is what he wanted uh, everybody uh, who was kind of fighting alongside him also to understand. So the austerity that Gandhi seemed to symbolize uh, had nothing to do with the, his vision. He, he wanted prosperity for the, for the Indian children and indeed he worked for it uh, as a result of uh, uh, of his work. There were several million families in India who at least because of the spinning and the weaving got some more into their homes, reduced their starvation. So it is absolutely uh, ridiculous to suggest that, uh, that Gandhi wanted or somehow caused uh, uh, poverty, uh, poverty in India. But yes, Gandhi was really aware of uh, uh, how some um, kinds of uh, development really hurt people. Uh, of course, these days we, we are more conscious of, of the pollution and the environmental hazards of reckless development. That is what Gandhi was after. But I would concede that if you take some sentences of Gandhi out of their context, then you may get the impression. But we must also remember that Gandhi's critique of uh, modern civilization was part of his critique also of colonialism. Uh, and as far as India was concerned, colonialism and so-called modern civilization came at the same time. And Gandhi was not going to compromise on his opposition to colonialism. Uh, but uh, we must also balance that with the great friendships Gandhi had with so many people in Britain, in Europe, in America. He certainly was not anti-Western. Uh, sentences taken out of context may suggest that he was against industrialization. He was not, and I think uh, the short sentence that is often quoted, I think, does represent the, the reality. Uh, Gandhi felt that production by the masses was superior to just mass production. And certainly in a country like India with tremendous population, uh, if you only had a few factories employing a few thousand people and vast millions unemployed, that was no economic solution, but if every consumer also became a producer, that is an economic solution. Gandhi's global legacy, what a remarkable legacy he has left behind. Let's start with the United States. Most people are at least dimly aware of the profound influence he had on Martin Luther King Jr. 
but few people know that his influence on the African American civil rights movement greatly predates Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of African American civil rights leaders in that day and age made long steamership voyages to India and met with Gandhi. Could you please talk a bit about that? Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Of course, Martin Luther King uh, has himself written so clearly and so precisely and repeatedly about uh, what he uh, learned from Gandhi's methods and from Gandhi's life. Of course, he, they never met each other. He visited India after Gandhi's death. But as you've mentioned, there were a stream of African-American uh, visitors to India uh, in the 20s and the 30s. Um, Howard Thurman, Benjamin Mays, uh, uh, and various others. Uh, and in fact, um, from 1917 onwards, the African-American press in the United States kept reporting Gandhi's activities. Isn't that amazing? 1917 onwards, uh, especially the church journals, the ch uh, African-American church, uh, and, uh, and those who went out to India in the 30s often met him and some African-American journalists uh, met, uh, met Gandhi, uh, Gandhi in India. And the statement that was often quoted from Gandhi that my life is my message was first given by Gandhi to an African-American journalist, I think a man called Denton Brooks, who visited India just after the war. So uh, yes, the African-Americans uh, who met Gandhi uh, uh, in the 30s um, came, came away with, with a great deal of encouragement. And Gandhi, when he heard them talk, and of course he was always quizzing them about the, uh, uh, civil rights in America. And, um, and then after a particular meeting, uh, this was 1936, uh, Gandhi, when he heard the responses of the African Americans who were visiting him, that is when he said that it may be that the real demonstration of the power of nonviolence will come from the African Americans in the United States. This was a kind of prophetic statement that Gandhi made in 1936. There's a very moving episode in your book when he meets the Thurmans, I believe, yes. and uh, Mrs. Thurman uh, sings a spiritual to him. Yes. And then I believe uh, Mahadev Desai, Gandhi's secretary, says that he was uh, he didn't he was he, he never was so moved as he was at that particular moment. Could you talk a bit about that? Yes, uh, this is the meeting where Gandhi made this uh, uh, you might say prediction that uh, nonviolent uh, um, strategy would really succeed in the United States. Um, and Gandhi's uh, secretary, Mahadev Desai, said that he had never seen Gandhi so excited, uh, welcoming his guest with such enthusiasm as when the Thurmans uh, uh, and, and uh, um, not now getting the name of the person who went with, uh, with Thurman, uh, also uh, Carol. Um, so, um, yes, uh, that is when um, when Gandhi made this uh, assessment and uh, and they uh, when they sang the spirituals uh, Gandhi felt that this was very much uh, uh, the spirit uh, of the battle that he was trying to wage and he felt a tremendous bond with them uh, and of course he asked practical questions about uh, the civil rights situation here and so that was a very significant uh, meeting Another American on whom Gandhi had a really profound influence was Cesar Chavez and the farm workers movement. Yes. Uh, Chavez says that when he saw a documentary on Gandhi when he was 11 or 12 and saw this little brown man stand up against the British Empire, that was probably the single most inspirational movement, uh, moment in his life. Uh, could you talk a bit about his influence on Cesar Chavez? Uh, to be honest, I have not studied it at, uh, sufficiently, but I'm aware as you know, my study so far has been more Gandhi's life rather than his legacy. But I'm aware, in fact, I had the privilege of meeting Cesar Chavez, so I'm, I'm aware that, yeah, that uh, but I don't know the, the details of it. I know that uh, uh, Chavez was profoundly impacted, and I know that, um, so that is a very important part of, uh, of, of, the, of the Gandhi legacy, of course. Ashis Nandi, this Indian intellectual, uh, has said, that virtually every major dissenting movement in the world owes its inspiration to Gandhi, be it concerning the environment, alternative science and technology, feminism, human rights, anti-consumerism, resistance to nuclear weapons and globalization, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, directly or indirectly, they draw upon Gandhi's legacy. 
Can you talk a bit about Gandhi's global legacy? And this is sort of an afterword to your book. Yes. Well, I think I should really be given time to do more research on that. Sure. You know, I'm aware of it in a very general sense, sure. and Ashish Nandi has said that. Yeah. And I think it is a uh, uh, perhaps true. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, when people see that this man without weapons, without wealth, uh, is able to produce this terrific result, then why shouldn't we be able to do it in our situation? That, and th I, I discovered this, uh, you know, when I travel to different parts of the world, whatever the purpose of my travel, when people know that I'm Gandhi's grandson, uh, very often I'm told, meet somebody that is fighting. Uh, I was in Okinawa and they said, there is somebody who's known as the Okinawa Gandhi, please meet him because he's fighting for issues there. Similarly, in other parts of the world, uh, I met a Native American from um, somewhere in the in the Dakotas and um, he said about his great-grandfather about the impact that Gandhi in India made on this great-grandfather of this uh, Native American in the United States uh, and it was a profound impact so somehow uh, the dispossessed uh, the disfranchised uh, the, the vulnerable people of the world have felt that despite their weakness uh, they can put up a fight uh, after all Gandhi did it why can't we so that is undoubtedly a, f a feature of our world biggest irony of all is that Gandhi never ever got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, the biggest uh, practitioner of nonviolence the most famous uh, symbol of nonviolence uh, do you have any speculation as to why that was the case? Uh, to be honest, I have never been that concerned about it. Um, uh, after all, uh, our world is not a world of, of great fair play or justice you know, in such matters. And in a way, uh, so many uh, things that should happen don't happen. And I never uh, can even picture myself picture uh, myself getting excited about Gandhi receiving the Nobel Prize or picture Gandhi <laughs> being awarded the, the Nobel Prize. I think that uh, Gandhi has uh, been given a prize by millions of people in their hearts, in their minds and that absolutely satisfies him. Um, the, the history of the Nobel Prize committees and why they didn't and why they couldn't, that's a, that's a relatively less significant matter to me. Let's talk about, talk about Gandhi's legacy uh, in his birthplace, uh, in his home country, India, and certainly it's been mixed. Uh, could you just talk briefly about that? Yes, that is a very major question. Um, although Indians are proud of Gandhi, every Indian currency note has Gandhi's face, Gandhi's statues are seen in many places. Um, I think there is a fair amount of repudiation of Gandhi in India's life. Um, certainly the uh, accumulation of goods, the accumulation of money and the indifference by the well-off towards the great many who are not well-off is a, a rejection of, of Gandhi's teaching. Um, also, uh, whether it is the um, fundamentalists or extremists on the Hindu side or the Muslim side, that is a reality too. It's not the dominant reality, but it's a very strong reality in India. And that too is a challenge to Gandhi's life and teachings. Uh, and then there is the, um, the atomic bomb and the great uh, um, enthusiasm and of, of so many in India to, to have uh, a nuclear arsenal. So that is also a, a challenge to, to what Gandhi uh, stood for. Uh, so that is one part, a very s a sobering part of India's reality. But then there is India's democracy. Uh, there is uh, the reality that the so-called untouchables ha now have rights. And there is this leader, Mayawati, in, in, in the biggest state of India, who comes from so-called untouchable background, who is now the elected chief minister. Uh, she is often very critical of, of Gandhi and uh, of many of the things that Gandhi stood for. Uh, but I would say that the empowerment of the, uh, of the weak, of the untouchables, is a, is a tremendous advance as far as India is concerned. So the democracy, uh, the empowerment of the weak, the fact that at least on paper and often in practice, minorities can be protected, uh, that women are getting uh, uh, at least some belated recognition opportunities in village government, if not uh, 
proportionate seats in parliament which too will come before before long those are on the on the on the plus side so i would uh, i would say that gandhi remains a force in india although uh, the at attraction of many uh, kind of un-Gandhian ideas is, is also visible in India. And of course there are Gandhian movements trying to keep alive his legacy as small and isolated as they may be sometimes. And they're not that, that, uh, that few uh, and it is uh, for untouchables, for Hindu Muslim unity, for leprosy work, uh, for the tribals, for women's rights, for water, for the environment. There are numerous groups. Some uh, use Gandhi's name and some don't. But they are carrying forward Gandhi's legacy in a very uh, remarkable way. Gandhi's assassination on January 30th, 1948 was uh, an act of supreme sacrifice. Uh, how, no matter how tragic it was, in some ways uh, it actually helped create a remarkable legacy within India. Uh, for example, uh, the Hindu Muslim rioting uh, almost completely died down the Hindu nationalist movement was set back by a few generations. Uh, Americans may not know he was assassinated by a Hindu nationalist named Nathuram Godse for uh, supposedly appeasing Muslims and making India weak. Can you talk about uh, a bit more about uh, the legacy his assassination left behind? Yes, um, it is undoubtedly true that uh, after he was killed by uh, this man who came with a group of people it was not just one person but there was a group of people who were uh, kind of committed to killing him and they succeeded um, and at that time because the Hindu Muslim riots had taken place and India's India had been partitioned and many India were genuinely unhappy about the partition of India uh, so uh, the atmosphere was such that the Hindu right had a very favorable climate but when Gandhi was assassinated, because the vast majority of the Indians and the vast majority of Indians were Hindus and they loved uh, Gandhi, and so the assassination of Gandhi made uh, the Hindu extremists extremely unpopular. And uh, in fact, they didn't know where to hide for a long time because uh, the Indian people felt that something uh, re uh, horrible had been done. Um, and so those who did it, uh, that their ideas really deserve rejection. This was the reaction of the Indian people. Uh, so for about 40 years thereafter, uh, the uh, Hindu extremists uh, had a setback. After that, uh, there has been a, a resurgence and there were some years when uh, a party representing them, though not necessarily representing all the extreme views, but representing many of the views uh, were in power. Uh, and that ended in, in 2004. We don't quite know what the future uh, will have. Uh, but um, so that is a very important part of the Gandhi legacy that uh, requires vigilance on the part of all those who, who feel that Gandhi's legacy is, uh, is worth preserving. On the flip side, Gandhi al always regretted the fact that he was unable to reach out to Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. Uh, does the creation of Pakistan and the attendant uh, massive riots and massacres in some ways sort of uh, negate or at least place a question mark on the legacy of Gandhi? Undoubtedly, uh, Gandhi wanted a united India. He, uh, he was opposed to the division. He finally acquiesced uh, with great regret in it. Uh, so it, it can be, it should be said that Gandhi failed in his attempt to keep India united, keep India one. On the other hand, uh, Gandhi has, uh, has uh, his life and legacy have helped reduce the, the mistrust between India and Pakistan even, between Hindus and Muslims on the subcontinent. Uh, so Gandhi's legacy is a very strong force that prevents the matter from getting worse or enables the matter to get better. Uh, uh, so uh, one should also perhaps appreciate the fact that uh, Gandhi was not the only voice in India. There were more voices, you mentioned Jinnah, uh, that, that asserted with great emphasis that Muslims had to have this complete separate life, that they can't live with, with Hindus. And there were many Hindus who were saying exactly the same thing. And as you probably know, uh, Savarkar, who one of the founders of the Hindu right idea, he said in 1937 uh, before Jinnah that Hindus and Muslims are two nations. So there were the Hindus who were saying Hindus and Muslims are two nations. There were the Muslims who were saying Hindus and Muslims are two nations. And it was Gandhi saying, no, they're not. They can be one people. Uh, Gandhi won a great many 
on the Hindu side and on the Muslim side to his point of view, but a great many uh, were persuaded by the others. He is reported to have said, and perhaps this is apocryphal, that the two individuals he was unable to reach out to were his oldest son Hari Lal and, Mom, his, uh, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, uh, can you, can you yes. say? Well, whether or not he said it is undoubtedly true. He wanted to win Jinnah, he certainly wanted to win his eldest son. And he failed with both, but uh, it's not just a black and white story like that. Gandhi and Jinnah had a very interesting relationship. And although at a crucial moment uh, Jinnah uh, rejected uh, Gandhi, it's also true, as, uh, as, as is known and as is described in the book, that Gandhi had this idea that one way of perhaps uh, preventing partition was to let Jinnah be the Prime Minister of United India. And his very close colleagues, Nehru, Patel, Rajgopalachari, Rajendra Prasad and others said, no, 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 we will never allow this. So the proposal was never put to Jinnah. It's also true that uh, if he had not been assassinated, he was going to Pakistan. And intermediaries had met Jinnah, and Jinnah was all set to receive Jinnah, uh, receive Gandhi. So we don't know whether the, how the Gandhi-Jinnah relationship would have uh, developed after uh, both countries became independent, had he not been killed. Similarly with his eldest son, uh, he failed, but he tried again. He failed, he tried again, sometimes succeeded and failed again. So yes, uh, broadly speaking, he failed with these two. But I think uh, those who are devoted to Jinnah or to his eldest son, will find that uh, Gandhi was really trying to be a friend. Let's end with the movie Professor Gandhi that has made Gandhi famous in the West, Richard Attenborough's Gandhi. It's been 25 years or so now that it's been released, won a number of Oscars. Uh, what's your opinion of the movie? Of course, this is now uh, an old movie, you might say. It was made 20 plus years ago. But I think it was a wonderful movie. No movie can do justice to a any life really, I think, adequately. Certainly no movie can relate uh, all the main uh, kind of events or challenges in, in an individual's life. But did it suggest, uh, did it give a, a flavor of what Gandhi was like, what his challenges were like, what his uh, unique style was like? Um, I would say it, it, it succeeded. So it was interesting that this Englishman uh, was able to make this film so that Gandhi now speaks to millions in the world in part thanks to this Englishman. And what a remarkable performance by Ben Kingsley of as, course, as, as Gandhi. Of course, yes, absolutely so. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gandhi. Uh, you've written an amazing book for anyone who wishes to uh, get profound insights into what Gandhi was about. I'd highly recommend the book. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.